Oh, dude, we didn't even say the name of your podcast, did we? All right. Create, collaborate. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I would have. I probably would have just completely spaced it. Yeah, create, collaborate. I use eights at the end because I want people to struggle finding it. <laughs> nice. Welcome to Creative Ops, a podcast for creative people. Hey everybody, welcome back to Creative Ops, a podcast for creative people. Real quick before I start the show, I'm going to quick pitch you my book. It's called Switchers. It's a time travel adventure story, and I think you'll like it. Go to ChristopherTallon.com, check out the book, see the links for where you can see the reviews that people have left already on Goodreads and where you can order it. That is all about that. Thank you for coming here today. I have a fantastic interview with Jody Sperling, a writer and podcast host, just like somebody else we know. He has a podcast and a website called Create Collaborate. You can see that in the show notes. It has numbers in it, so it's not all letters. It's Create Collaborate with the eights in the places that make it you know, sound like Create Collaborate. It's a great podcast. He has lots of great strategies about writing, promoting yourself, using social media, and it's uh, actually changed my whole experience with Twitter just in the last couple days. He talks about how to use social media, how to use TikTok. He talks to a lot of other writers to find out what they're doing, things to uh, just improve your life if you're a writer in the world trying to find an audience. And he's got a good voice, too. He's got a very... uh, almost kind of like an NPR, This American Lifestyle, very soothing voice, good stuff. Anyway, I'll put stuff in the show notes for where you can find him, his show, uh, some stuff that you can also read from him, and uh, in the meantime, get ready for an interview. We talk about growing up, finding your thing, and uh, trying to make a splash in the world. So here it is, Jody Sperling. Thank you for coming on an hour late well for being forgiving of my lateness i should say <laughs> you were there i was late uh, it's, we'll blame it on we'll blame it on my calendar <laughs> there you go stupid technology yeah dang it so jody you're from colorado yes yeah i am i'm from colorado I, i'm a, a native coloradan which is a rarity these days it seems <laughs> yeah it seems like that's a place that a lot of people in the midwest are going to uh austin texas or they're going to colorado or they're going to the pacific northwest yes exactly yeah Yeah. and i I spent a little time in the pacific northwest i did the whole spokane thing i loved it there i dream about going back coeur d'alene especially and and idaho is a phenomenal place so there's going to be a tie-in here but (laughs) some pictures that i saw of you with your wife there was chicago cubs hats shirts a w flag so I'm getting kind of a Midwest vibe from your wife. Is that accurate? Yeah, for sure. Now the Cubs does the, the, the Cubs part comes from my family. Both both of my parents all come from the Chicago land area. Um, so she would technically be a Royals fan. Uh, I made her vow when we got married to be a Cubs fan. It was sort of like a, a, a package deal. Like with a religion, you have to you have to officially turn that religion before you can be together. That's exactly right. And we we went ahead and we don't go to church anymore, but we still watch Cubs games. <laughs> Tis the Cubs that binds us. Yeah, that's right, man. <laughs> so then how far back does that go? Did your parents move to Colorado or? Yes. So my my dad especially had a love of the mountains and wanted to be around the mountains all the time and so he moved there uh with uh my mom long time before i was born i think they had my sister already at that point so i think my sister was born in in illinois and then they moved to uh colorado did you meet your wife there did you meet her in nebraska why nebraska so my dad's parents landed in the Omaha area, and I uh, 
of course, was with them until I got myself into all manner of trouble when I was a young guy. I just, I really, if, if there was trouble to be had, absolutely. Alcohol. That surprises troubles, me like, because you seem like a pretty like calm, thoughtful kind of dude, but there's the other side to me. There really is. There's the the part of me. I, I think that I, I self regulate to the best of my ability until I yeah. get to kind of like the pressure cooker point. So I do mm -hmm. have that. And I still struggle with that to this day, thankfully through good support systems and my wife. I am able to stop kind of those pressure cooker moments because I feel I'm coming at this yeah. point. I'm like, okay, it's time to figure it out, address it, work through it. But yeah, that, and that's, so getting back to your question though, that took me from Colorado to move back to Omaha where my dad's parents were living. Um, and they just gave me a little bit of tough love, but also more attention than I was getting. And mm. I was too old to be living with anybody at that point. I was 19, but I just hadn't had like a good stable environment. So they gave me about a year and a half, I think, living with them, kind of feeling like part of a family. And it really did propel me into the rest of my life and a lot of good things that have happened since then. So yeah. that's that's how I got to Omaha. Met my wife here uh, through church. Like I said, I, I found her there. And then we have since jettisoned. Um, and there, like I said, there's a huge backstory to... I, I'm well, happy you can... for everybody who finds an identity inside of the church. I'm really happy for for everybody. I I don't feel like my story is here to say like you shouldn't go to the church because it wounds, but it it did cause me a lot of damage and a lot of the shame yeah. in my life comes from sort of the religious uh, track that plays in my mind about how I'm supposed to be as a human being, uh, yeah. and I still fight that. Yeah, well, that, I mean that's that's big all around. There's uh, <laughs> uh, one of my one of my friends sister posted something on Facebook about like several books she's read about like deprogramming the way you feel about sexuality after leaving the church. Yeah. And you know, so there's, there's that, but there's just lots of things. Like you said, they'll make mm -hmm. you feel bad at some, not every church, but uh, churches that do have kind of a destructive tendency. They'll, they'll uh, play on your anxiety more than they'll try to ease them. So it, it can be damaging for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my wife and I actually met <laughs> when we were uh, like the summer between middle school and high school at a at a teen church youth group. But uh, now neither of us are really not to say that we're not spiritual. That's kind of sounds like a cop out to be like, I'm spiritual, mm -hmm. not religious. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I try not to take my thumb off the pulse of just like yeah. feeling more than just what's around me without necessarily putting a a, a dogma to it. Yeah. Here's a tie in for you because um, I, the first time I saw your face, I thought you look a lot like a guy named William Fitzsimmons. I don't know if you listen to music or not, but he's I thought a, you were going to say Brett Gelman. I get that uh, a lot. Nope. Nope. Check out <laughs> William Fitzsimmons. Um, it, it's probably the beard uh, moves it that way a little bit too. But um, so I went to a show with uh, my, at the time she was my girlfriend. Now she's my wife um, to see William Fitzsimmons in Omaha. And I just, I love his music so much. I still like his music, but we go outside afterwards. I'm going to smoke a cigarette and he's out there having a cigarette. And so I, I was like, Hey man, I notice a lot of like spiritual themes in your music. Are you, are you religious? And, and he's like, well, or I think he even said, are you Christian? Cause one of his songs has a very strong Christian theme to it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I asked him and he's like, well, I'm spiritual, you know? And I, I did, I remember at the time thinking, I want something more than that. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. Not identifying at this point. Cause I don't myself, but yeah. that, like that sense of sort of free floating spiritualism is, I don't know how to do it, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it comes from just kind of, at least in my experience, I'm not, I'm not trying to be anybody's guru or anything, but <laughs> you know, just kind of accepting that some answers just aren't going to come and kind of feeling things out and you know, having confidence, I guess, in your intuition without feeling, uh, feeling like there's something wrong with how you feel kind of just think yeah. about it and accept it. You know what I mean? Which is a lot easier said than done. <laughs> yes. A lot easier said than done. <laughs> Cause I went to a Catholic church and no, my priest first people, first question people say is, <laughs> was your priest one of those? He wasn't one of those, but he did make the cover of the USA today, uh, for embezzling like millions of dollars over a couple of decades from the church. And built a mansion down the street, a, a gated mansion <laughs> oh. down the street from the oh. church. And that's when people were like, hold on. How did this happen? Yeah. <laughs> and they found money hidden in the ceilings with the bag, you know, deposit oh. only for the church written on the bag still. And, and like, this he was is just straight taking it from the church. To his house. Comes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I know. There's, somebody's going to make a movie about it eventually. Oh. 
Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a good that's a good first 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Then when did you start really getting into uh, creative stuff and was it writing first? Because I mean, I was really into drawing and kind of visual art, but Mm. found out by about eighth grade that some people just had an exceptional talent and I just liked it a lot. You know what I mean? I was drawing stick figures compared to some kids. Yeah, you know, that is I, I love that point that you make because I'm in conflict with that statement on a daily basis in I have zero visual talent. I cannot draw to save my life. Um, I have a few pieces of art that I completed in high school that my art teacher had a really heavy hand in that I can look at and not vomit. But otherwise, (laughs) let's, yeah, yeah, keep me away from anything where I'm going to try to represent it that way. Uh, And the same is honestly true of music. So I went through the phase where I think a lot of young men do, especially young men in the church, since we're just having that conversation where you play the guitar because you want to like make people feel stuff and girls tend to like guitars as you're thinking at that time Mm -hmm. um and i have no rhythm i can literally listen to a song and then try to play it and i speed up and slow down just depending on whatever i'm personally feeling so like i'm just imagining like steve martin from the jerk have you ever seen that (laughs) yes yeah yeah (laughs) yeah he's trying real hard to get the rhythm you just can't <laughs> that is me that is exactly me it's a perfect perfect metaphor for for how i am and so all of this to say um one of my philosophies as a writer is that anybody is able to write a book i really do believe that there is no person who cannot write a book hmm. it all comes in with the amount of work it takes to get there and some of us it will literally take 15 years of discipline study to write a book but when I contrast those two things, I do. I'm in conflict with my own stance on that that issue. So I, I didn't really answer your question when I started, but I'm fascinated by that idea of like sort of something is inborn, right? Yeah, I think so. And, th- and somebody was saying that they think that that's tied in with neurodivergence, which I don't know. Maybe it is. I've interviewed a few <laughs> people on the show that seem very like I have my schedule. I do everything just mm-hmm. so and like very regimented and together that way but i've met quite a few who were exactly the opposite and were like i did terrible in school and i was always like you said i was kind of a troublemaker kid you know we'd run through backyards and if somebody was growing tomatoes we'd rip them off and throw them at the house (laughs) and like just dumb shit like that you know what i mean yeah so yeah where did you land as far as uh in school because i know and we're going to talk about you have an F- mfa or you I do. we're working on it you have it okay i do have it yeah um i was not i was neither good nor bad i just was somewhat absent of things that i didn't care about i think probably if you were going to classify who i actually am i do fall into like that adhd spectrum from how i understand it to be now and i also have three sons and i'm watching at least one of them really go through that experience yeah, yeah. and it reminds me of my own so Probably if you wanted to diagnose, that's where I landed. The things that I loved, I could focus on endlessly. Mm. The things that don't catch my attention, it's real hard to engage me at all. Um, Is that? Yeah. 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 No, that sounds, that sounds like it fits the bill just from a very, you know, generic explanation of it. And I've talked to a few other people too, that kind of, uh, well, a guy I talked to recently, Derek Moore, he said that he was not so much like a pain to the teachers. I was a pain to the teachers. Couldn't sit still. Always wanted to lean over and talk to somebody. And he was mm-hmm. more just look out the window and kind of forget where he was kind of a guy. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's yeah. very much like that. Yeah. I had a little bit of both, but I was also tremendously sleep deprived as a kid. Uh, as a kid yeah. I was staying up late watching TV. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. So then when did writing become a big thing for you? Did you find that kind of like early? Were you always writing I'm going to speak to my own experience. I was always writing like in notebooks and like Mm -hmm. we talked about my mom found one from when I was like 15 and it was super embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, (laughs) kind of always just goofing around with writing? Did you always take it fairly seriously or? Yeah, definitely not always take it seriously. Um, I do. If I look back to my earliest age, I read the, the Lord of the Rings when I was 10 years old, which I think is a little bit young for that book. Um, my dad thrust it at me and, and I, I like, I connected with it in a weird way. Also, it felt like a challenge because there were really big words and concepts and, 
pacing is not what children typically enjoy, but I, I got into it. And so I think that I wrote some silly hidden fan fiction type of stuff based on uh, the Lord of the Rings and mm -hmm. the fantasy universe. Back uh, before it was for, popular to yeah, do that. Probably, that's probably, I, think, yeah. I think that's probably true. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> so I, I dabbled in that a little bit and journaling has always been really close to me, but similar to what you say is I think I identify as somebody who is sort of a scrap paper opportunist. There was like something mm -hmm. nearby and a pen and a thought and just boom. And then it ended up in the trash because I'm not, I'm not collecting my life works at that point. Yeah. That's a real, that might be the name of uh, this episode. Scrap paper, scrap paper opportunist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, did you immediately go uh, from high school into college and college into an MFA program, or Ooh. what was that kind of path looking like? So that's the troubled part. Is um, as a probably the summer of freshman year in high school is when I when I discovered um, a lot of things, and I was having conflict at home, and so. Uh, went to see, oh my gosh, I didn't even plan this. I swear I didn't plan this. Went to see the second installment of The Lord of the Rings when it came out in theaters. Uh, I believe it was the second. Anyways, definitely Lord of the Rings. And uh, we went to a pre-party at the University of Colorado. So CU Boulder, there was a party there. Guy is like, oh, I've got this, you know, this vodka. You take shots. I'm going to go take a shower and get ready for the thing. As soon as I get back, I'll match any shots you take. So <laughs> this is this is me pretty much my first drinking opportunity and I'm like I'm gonna get him hammered. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I got him hammered and uh, it, it, it wound me up it wound me up in police custody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was it was a good first drinking opportunity and I, I enjoyed it enough that I, I have a lifelong love for, for alcohol. Um but yeah at that at that point um I, I went down a long period of time where I was kind of bouncing around. Um I went to a boarding school uh to kind of correct my behavior. That is truly where I discovered I wanted to be a writer. The principal at the boarding school told me that I had a gift for writing. He he pulled me aside and he's he had read an essay I wrote for a criminal justice class and he's like You need to think about writing in your future because this is something I've never seen before. Which I mean even to this day, thinking about that feedback to a kid that young, and I, I really want to doubt his assessment of it, but at the same time, yeah, yeah, yeah. it is that moment. Like, well, teachers got to say stuff like that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So um, that that led me to be kind of too young to live on my own, and my mom helped me pay for an apartment trying to get me on my feet, but I was living alone. I didn't have accountability. Got in more trouble still. And didn't really, that's how the church, again, gets back into this. It's weird how it all kind of spirals back in itself is I needed accountability. And I happened to find it in the church at that time in my life when I really needed somebody to just be like, hey, shithead, that's not a good idea. Try something else. And so I, I really dug into shame as being a big motivator and be ashamed of who I was and be really proud because I can now have a landmark moment where I changed everything because I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And now everything is different from this moment. I can actually point to it on a calendar and say, I was a bad person then. Now I'm a good person. Yeah. Um, and and that was a journey that I took for a long time. Um, I went, I, I've, I've digressed a little bit, but I didn't start college for quite a while because I believed that it was a waste of time until I figured out that there were uh, fine arts programs where you could actually study fiction. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought, I want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, there was like a senior level class uh, that was just Harry Potter for uh, <laughs> like, you know, I can't remember what it was. There's like rotating authors, things that they do. The one that I ended up taking was Toni Morrison. But yeah. Well, oh, yeah. The two that I thought would have been interesting, even though I haven't read Harry Potter. I know I got to read Harry Potter <laughs> um, would be to take that just as a college class or uh, a study of Kurt Vonnegut, too, would have been good. But Toni mm -hmm. Morrison was great. Yeah. 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 Uh, Beloved is, is a book that I, I got a clash against the rocks with. I, it, the, the, the milk just, it was a metaphor that hit me hard every time. And I was like, it felt, it just didn't quite settle into the book. I didn't find her until um, Song of Solomon. I think I'm, that's not quite the title, right? Ooh, yeah. No Song of Solomon. Oh, that's the song. Song. that Ooh, a lot good, of people say Beloved's their favorite. And I see why it's good. Yeah. I like Song of Solomon too. Wow. That book is really really something the song of solomon is working on every level i love it yeah and it she she really dabbles in horror more than people give her mm. credit for too yeah like she creates really like almost traumatic experiences in her books mm -hmm. yeah yeah so then um 
where did you end up going to uh, school for your bachelor's and then uh, for the MFA? So I did University of Nebraska in Omaha for my undergrad and had a handful of amazing, amazing teachers. Uh, Sarah Mason, I think her professional name is Sarah McKinstry Brown. It's a poet. Uh, she's, I think, only released two volumes so far, um, which is, you know, I would love to see more from her. But um, she she bled more words onto our assignments than anybody I've ever seen before. You would write a, a seven line free form poem and she would fill up the entire rest of the white space yeah, with yeah, comments. Yeah. And yeah, that, that was huge for me. I felt I felt important, which I think is is great for any artist to feel important, to feel noticed. Yeah. Um, but also her kindness was very shepherding. So that was a great experience. And Miles Wagner there was was also a poet and. Uh, he he was so smart. You you could feel his intelligence in the room, and mm. it inspired you. You're like, I have to rise to that level and think at that level. There are good things and bad things about that. I'm probably a little pretentious at times, where I've had to recover from that because I I am attracted to intelligence. Yeah. Um, and there's others. I'm I'm not mentioning everybody, but those are two that were really important. Well, if you're yeah, especially if you're engaged, like if you're in college just to like go because your parents are like you're going to college, then you <laughs> yeah. might not be that into it. But I always appreciated it when I had to kind of step my game up. It was intimidating, especially if I couldn't skip get all the writing or reading in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because <laughs> there were definitely a couple of days where like I did not read every chapter of Huck Finn that was yes. assigned. I'm going to be a little bit lost <laughs> about halfway through tonight. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, it's I've, I've had those days and they're they're awful. You walk in and you're like, just don't look at me. If I don't look at you, it's like I'm a cat under a couch. You can't see me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or you have to be very vague and be like, yeah, I don't know. You could say that, but should you? You know, like <laughs> little Leslie Nope on him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wrote a novel mm-hmm. that got uh you picked up and agented right yeah was that something that you worked on in the mfa or was that something that you like took those mfa skills and said i'm applying those towards this now independently of that yeah so um between the, the I, I knew right away w- once i did the bfa experience that i wanted to uh, go into an MFA. That was something that I really aspired to. Which um, is a Master and... of Fine Arts for anyone who's wondering what that is. Oh, thank you. Sorry. And about that. Yeah, Master of Fine Arts and with, Creative Writing was the focus. And with that, you can teach it most for your schools in a creative writing program. It's considered to be yes, like a right. terminal degree in writing, even though there yes. are some doctorates for writing, but not like Correct. widely yeah. accessible programs. Yeah. So if you go the if you go the fine arts route, you can quit after after a master's, which is far easier in every regard. If you go the uh the um just degree of arts so Mm. uh you could have an ma was the old degree before the iowa writers workshop came around Mm. um then then you could get uh you had to get a phd to teach at the terminal level at college so that would be um, a doctor of of the arts and you actually have to learn a second language if you do that route so you have to be fluent in yeah english and something else i'm not i've tried a little bit but um so the fa is much easier fine arts yeah yeah and my just to Real quick, harken back to what you were saying about you had a teacher that was so great, a professor that was so great. I also did, and I thanked her in my book. And she was an MFA. She didn't she didn't have the doctor title, but you know, even without a doctor title, still inspired me more than well, I won't talk shit about the other doctors because there were some really good people in that program, but hmm. yeah, she she really reached me. Absolutely. So I wrote a collection of, of linked short stories based on uh, an author that I really fell in love with. His name's David Philip Mullins. He wrote a book called Greetings from Below. And say, say the name again. I you said it kind of fast. I want to make sure I heard it right. Sorry about that. No, that's David fine. David Philip Mullins, uh, and the book was Greetings from Below. It's linked short stories about kind of a troublemaker who is living in Las Vegas and kind of his adventures. And it really hit a note for me. And so. Uh, I already had started experimenting with that very real life, um, what they call literary fiction style at that point in Mm. short story form. And then I liked linking it up. So I liked the feel of kind of the expanse that you get by almost making it a novel, but you're a little more free between episodes. Um, At the same time, I read Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. And that book sort of cemented what I thought was the perfect blend of fiction. So I wrote this enormous book of kind of, 
memoir slash fictitious thing all smashed together. And that was the thesis for my MFA. I shopped that for a little while. I had made a great connection in the MFA with a, a, a brilliant guy who teaches the new school. His name is Joe Salvatore. I'm mentioning the names, by the way, because if people are listening, these are people you should definitely read. Yeah. Um, I'm not name dropping. They're not They're not big enough to name drop. They're amazing people who deserve to be big enough to be name dropped. Um, <laughs> so uh, Joe, Joe connected me with an agent and I thought like, here I am. I'm just about to be Kurt Vonnegut. Like this is the moment. It's happening. It's really happening. And she read and said, it's not for me. Um, so I shopped around a little bit more, but I knew that if I got that good of an introduction and couldn't get the agent, that it was ultimately not the project to move forward on. So a couple of years went by and I thought I'm going to write a gripping, suspenseful, more commercial, more, um, reader friendly type of thing. And so, um, that turned out to be so hard. I can't even describe how difficult it is to write something that's thrilling and interesting. And honestly, I haven't, I haven't been picked up or sold this book yet. So maybe I didn't ultimately succeed, but enough to get an agent. Yeah. Uh, it's a detective novel called The Nine Lives of Marva DeLonghi. And um, I was inspired by Raymond Chandler. So that hard boiled kind of, um, you know, her face looked like a dried apple on the side of the road. Yeah, yeah. Feeling too <laughs> good, so. That's, yeah, I think, I think it was either Stephen King or Elmore Leonard specifically talks about him and that he, he's got some of the best similes. <laughs> yeah he really does it's crazy yeah he's and so he like grabs you and if you're if you're a younger writer which i, I still feel I, I definitely was even in composing that novel yeah um you reach for the things that are loud because that's what you notice when your eyes aren't attuned to kind of smaller details and so mm. that louder tone of hard-boiled is uh i think i think a lot of writers um will find that attractive at first and and lastingly so yeah so what uh tell me a little bit more about the book itself and yeah. then we'll uh talk about what you're going to do with it and uh well we'll talk about how you wrote it specifically but yeah, yeah. I, i'm intrigued to hear more of it so uh, the story i'll tell you what it became because it was quite a journey the main the main character is a female detective um who her partner, um, they met looking for a kid on a milk carton, basically. Um, but they find themselves approached by a woman named Marva DeLonghi, who has sort of like a, you don't really understand why she's even there, but she wants them to investigate something for them. And when she leaves, they're like, I don't even know what she wants. Um, but her life is in danger. So she leaves with almost nothing earned, but they know that her life is imminently in danger. Mm -hmm. And she does, in fact, get killed pretty quickly, like the very next day. And they try to regather and figure out like what in the world happened. And then shortly after that, both of them get murdered. And the main character then wakes up again at the inciting moment outside of her office, walking in, recognizing this is Marva DeLonghi sitting in the chair talking to my partner. Same exact conversation sort of orients herself. And then you're off on, I mean, the shorthand for the rest of the book is kind of a Groundhog Day sort of a adventure of figuring out like our lives are tied to hers. And if we can't save her, we keep dying, but we can't figure out who's involved or why. Um, so yeah, kind of the trick is you don't you don't have to learn a ton up front because every time you die and come back, you get a different angle just incidentally that helps you put the puzzle together. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. So are you gonna I, I know you said before that you feel kinda eh about self publishing it, but do you have like, you know, if I can't get something done by this time, I'll just put it out or you gonna sit on it, you're gonna keep working on it, what are you gonna do? That is a real, that's a tough question, man. Um, so my, my answer to you right now is I'm trying to fix a couple holes in what I see as being the process. So mm. um, my agent, Annie is been really faithful to me and good to me. And so I want to sell a book with her and I want to do everything that I can to make it a success so that she can make as much money off of me as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I would love to actually, honestly, I would love to offer her just a paid position that I can always feed her my work when it's ready to go and she can be my editor and know that the door is open there and continue to pay her like an agent even if I self-publish yeah um, so that's kind of the what I'm thinking of right now is I, I would like that relationship eventually because I will move to self-publishing after I go through traditional publishing or maybe I'll self-publish and then try to traditionally publish off of the sales 
I don't have all of the statistics perfectly in my mind or the path. Um, but self-publishing is where I belong yeah. for a number of reasons. I really do enjoy marketing. I enjoy selling the book. Um, I have a, a, a great friend, JP, that I met in my MFA. He self-published uh, a, a book that is is beautiful called The, Cap- the Ketchup Factory. And mm. um, he's had a hard time selling it. And he's the sort of guy who has a really romantic vision of what an author is and is not. He doesn't want to have a public persona. He does not want to go out there and like hawk the book, any of those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. And I, I love the image that he has, but I also am equipped to be a little bit more out in front of things and be the salesperson. So self-publishing is where I belong, but I really would like the accolades or the stamp of approval from, uh, you know, Viking or, or uh, whoever it might be. Yeah, we, you, and, <laughs> you and me both. Because I've, I've been down that path. I've uh, submitted to agents. I had a couple that said, this isn't for me, but tried this person. And then oh, yeah. that person, you know, said, eh, you know, it's, I'm not really sure who it's for or just, just mm. know, you know, then yeah. um, talk to a couple small presses, but uh, I don't know. I feel like for what a small press does, mm-hmm. you can do it yourself. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. they're just going to put it for the most part, they're going to put it on a print on demand service, which mm-hmm. takes 40% of the profit right off the gate. And yep. then they're going to take 40% of what's left of your 60%. So I was <laughs> yeah. like, eh, I'm just going to yeah. take what pennies I can get and keep them, you know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the trade off that you get with going with a small press is, and, and I agree with you completely. And it's the least appealing of all options is to go small press. But the trade off you get is, is that you can easily move into a library because you do have distribution. Um, for whatever reason, bookstores don't trust self-publishing. We could talk a whole long time about whether that's valid or not, but, um, Small presses do get you in the door. Also speaking opportunities at colleges. If you're a self-pub, good luck getting somebody in a college to let you come do a reading or engage with the students because you're a hack. Yeah, unless, Which you're, is not true, unless you're one of the guys like, uh, I think it was A.G. Riddle was a self-published author on Amazon mm-hmm. who ended up getting like a really big three or five movie deal mm-hmm. or something like that. Right, exactly. There are other ways to get knighted in this kingdom, but yeah. Or Andy Weir, he's another one who I think Andy Weir started mm-hmm. self-publishing it. I think Blake Crouch originally self-published his first series. Okay. I could be wrong about that one. So I mean, you yeah. know, it it's not the it's not the stamp of you're never gonna work in this town again kind of kind of thing that it used to be. Because I had college exactly. professors that uh, actually one in particular who unfortunately has passed away who uh, used to write and get stuff published in the Atlantic from time to time, I think was his, mm. you know, his big publishing dig. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. He said, don't, don't self publish. Don't ever self publish. Mm-hmm. I was just like, Oh yeah. God, All right. But he was like, right, yeah. he's like, don't for real. Like, Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> by the time you get through college, if you don't have that message firmly ingrained in you, you didn't go to the right college. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, those was the same professors too, that were like, Oh, you guys, we had to go through all the books. We had to type on plate <laughs> writers and make sure everything was the right margin. It's like, well, that sounds just like you wasted most of your time in college. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> We talked a little process on uh, your show, but uh, let's get into yours. My process on paper is different than almost any other area of my life, and I'm not sure why it is, uh, but I have to start with the idea of the characters, and I have to write it until there's a a huge flaw, and then honestly kick it to the side and start over again. Um, Mm. And so the real truth about my process is I start and write until I hate the, the thing I'm working on. And then I throw it away and start again until I hate it. And eventually I get to an end. And usually at that point, um, usually not on my current novel that I'm working on, by the point I get to the end of the book, I'm like, yeah, okay, I got this. I figured this out. Um, and that was the process for everything up until the current current novel was filled out. I do not, I do not plot. I do not outline. I do not character sketch. Um, yeah. So it's, it's very, very amorphous for me. Do you feel like that's something that you learned something you were taught a little of both because i mean there are tons of people out there that'll give you all different kinds of this is how you plot a story this is how you find a character we have worksheets and diamond and or what do they call it snowflake method and you know all these different ways to Mm -hmm. to kind of create story from 
you know, a very singular idea. Where did, uh, where did your more freestyle idea come from? You know, it's funny because in the Bachelor of Fine Arts and the Masters of Fine Arts, you're not actually taught how to write. I know that sounds really weird, but it's actually true. You're not taught how to write and you're not taught how to publish. I'm not sure what they're teaching there because I, I enjoyed the experience, but I got out and there, there were like terms like whip uh, work in progress yeah. that I had never heard before. Um, and the, the, the list of acronyms uh, and abbreviations is pages long that I had never heard through all of my education or what they meant. I didn't know that there was such a thing as a beat sheet. Um, I didn't know that you could outline something that that was even an option. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being like sincere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so for me, it was, I want to create, I want to write, I'm inspired by these particular writers. And so I want to emulate them and probably Part of that is that the writers I was inspired by were people who did similarly. You mentioned Stephen King earlier. Mm. He is not a plotter and he's a huge uh, influence for me. If not, yeah, I mean, gosh, I've read 40 of his novels. So he's somewhere in the brain at all times for me. Yeah, he's got so um, many novels. They're all great. <laughs> yeah. He's got, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's um, frustrating as hell. <laughs> what, what's it called? On Writing, which is on writing. Exactly, probably phenomenal. the most entertaining nonfiction book I've ever re read. Yes. Um, yeah. And he's just, he's everywhere. His movies are everywhere. And if you look him up on YouTube, you can find countless speeches, interviews. So yeah. he's, he's just all, all around. He's a great source of information. If you're, yeah. if, if at the end of the day, you just want to be the kind of writer that people can't stop reading. <laughs> Isn't that the goal? Yeah. I, I wish that I could, I could just ride his coattails a little bit. I'd be okay with that. But right. I, I have endless admiration for him and he is the writer that the MFAs and the, the, school programs love to hate on too they all call him a hack as well yeah. which you right when you think about how my, many hacks there are out there I yes guess. my professors used to i actually got into it with one of them i was, I was a senior and i was finding like you know what what because they said something about well unless you're gonna be like stephen king and publish two books a year i was like <laughs> why do we hate people that are efficient at what they do <laughs> i mean exactly it comes out and every single one's a number one bestseller do you just think that many people are stupid and they're like well <laughs> yeah exactly well i think i think that people so i had a, a conversation i had to scrap um for my podcast this week and uh 99 of it is because the audio just didn't turn out right mm -hmm. um he didn't have the the you know setup that he needed or any kind of earbuds and the reason i say that is to to say like there there really truly was that reason behind it but also i'm listening to it in retrospect and he mentioned you know i'm really scared of subliminal messages because uh, I don't trust that people are smart enough to pick up on them. That was one of the, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's one of the quotes from the interview. I don't 100% hate that, but thinking about my readers and thinking about the people who read Stephen King and buy him, it fits in well to that conversation as I see it. Of like, yeah, they're not so stupid that they're going to buy trash. They're smart, educated readers. And there are people who work in factories and are smart. And there are people who work with their hands and are smart and they read Stephen King. There are also, I hate to tell anybody in the MFA teaching program right now, um, there are a lot of your students who are secretly reading Stephen King feeling like it's pornography. <laughs> so stop telling them that he's bad because he's yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. And people say the same thing like, um about james patterson which mm -hmm. you can like him or not like him his business <laughs> yeah. practices you know if, if you want to attack anything <laughs> yeah. i would attack that first but <laughs> yeah. um yeah. yeah the amount of stuff that says james patterson that he probably didn't <laughs> really do that much on um <laughs> yeah but, you just brought up you just brought up one that went too far for me i'm like i can't read him and i do insult him publicly so i read <laughs> now i'm now i'm a hypocrite <laughs> <laughs> i read one of his books uh, I think it was called Mary Mary, um, but it was uh, one of the Alex Cross novels, if I'm mm. thinking yeah. the right things. And I read it while my students, it was while I was still teaching in middle school and they were doing like all day computer testing. And I read that book in a day and a half and I was just like, it, it didn't really stick with me for very long afterwards, mm -hmm. but I just remember thinking like, I can't stop. I can't stop. <laughs> I can't stop. So there's something that he's doing that yeah. is very, uh, you know, it works because again, that many people mm -hmm. are reading it. So right. even if you want to call him a hack, 
Maybe he's a, oh, he's a one trick pony. He just writes short chapters and people keep reading. It's like, Mm -hmm. well, they still have to be good chapters. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. I actually got some flack from a buddy of mine. He's like, dude, uh, a lot of your chapters are only like two pages. I'm like, yeah, (laughs) kind of, kind of part of my style. I don't, I want to give you a good place to stop. So mentally you're like, oh, Mm -hmm. I can stop in two pages. But then when you get to the end and go, ah, that next one's only a couple of pages. I'm going to keep going. Mm-hmm. And some, yeah. some people say that's hack too, but I think it's all in whether or not you pull it off. So here's, here's a, a thing on that too. I, I had this conversation recently on, on Twitter with people, but it, there's something weird that happens that I, I typically range between 75 and hundred pages read a day. That's just, it's a personal goal. I want to keep the mind fresh with lots of ideas. Mm. The, the ease with which I do that has everything to do with how long the chapters are. I'm reading a great great novel right now called the epiphany machine ton of tiny chapters in it and it's so propulsive it's so propulsive that it feels like after 100 pages is done you're like whoa yeah i I can just go back and read those again easy peasy yeah whereas if it's two 50 page chapters i feel the weight of those chapters and i'm not sure what that is and there's nothing hackish about that that's actually just working with what the brain enjoys yeah well some i think some people would say you know if you lean on those tricks too much it's because your writing is lacking but you know you could go back and forth on it all day obviously i like short chapters because yeah at the end of the day i probably would have stayed away from keeping them as short as i did but i heard him Hmm. say like you know if you keep them short it keeps people engaged and i was like yeah that does make sense and so Mm -hmm. most of the time my chapters are like what i'll accomplish in one sitting of writing i love that yeah and some days I write six, seven pages without, without stopping. And then, you know, mm-hmm. I have a, have a quote long chapter. chapter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But what's, uh, what's your style like? Cause uh, I didn't get any uh, advanced reading from you. So yeah, are you, you uh, are you a short sentences guy? You like semicolons? What, what's, <laughs> what's your jam? You know, I, I do, I do enjoy the occasional semicolon. Um, that Joe Salvatore fellow that I mentioned, uh, he he co-authored a grammar textbook mm. um, that really dives into sentence diagramming. And that is actually a very near and dear to my heart. I love the big, long, complex sentences yes. and that you have to diagram to make sure that nothing's dangling. And it looks like a wooden roller coaster thing. when you're done with it. <laughs> exactly. I love those. <laughs> I think they're so much fun. Um, I try to keep those out of my fiction for the most part. I do because... Uh, Unless you're David Foster Wallace, it's pretty difficult. And I'm not just, I'm just not that smart. I want to be, I like smarts. I'm not. And so I don't sell yourself short, buddy. Come on. You seem like a pretty, pretty with it together guy with, (laughs) with a fully functioning brain. Yeah, that's true. But not, I I do. We talked about it. Inborn talents. That's not, I don't have it inborn, but I do have a passion to cultivate it. So um, my writing probably will limit me from that sort of bestseller category in the fact that um, I am accidentally drawn to a larger lexicon i do use more vocabulary than i probably should and i don't realize some of the stuff i need to dumb down some people uh, love well that as, though some people love it my oldest yeah. kid is going to be 21 this year Woo. and um <laughs> excuse me edit that up and she uh she when she was telling me about my book she didn't even read it she was like just make sure you use some big words because people who read a lot they really like it when they hit a big word. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then somebody else read it and said, um, some of the words in this book seem a little unrealistic for somebody of that age. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Let's talk about critics for a little while. That would be so much fun. Okay. First of all, let's, let's just dump on the easy ones. People that say, <laughs> can I read what you're working on? And you go here and they read it and then they just go, I liked oh. it. <laughs> yeah. And that's it. <laughs> what did you like about it? It just seemed really well written. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Did did you ever have any emotions about it? Yeah. What were they? I don't know, generally just positive. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if a creative person, specifically a writer, says, What did you think? We want like a paragraph. At least. <laughs> at least. <laughs> a, at least a paragraph. Well, the beginning did or didn't work for this or that reason i enjoyed the path all the way up to here and then you kind of lost me a little bit like they're afraid to say things like that because they think they'll offend you but that's mm-hmm. that's why we ask yeah absolutely yeah we're, we're looking for real feedback and it's okay um i've been i've been on a um oh i've lost the word i'm looking for but anyways i've been really hammering hard on this idea of there's a way to criticize 
any kind of text. So if you are trading critiques, um, it, there's nothing wrong with telling people things are great and being specific. I love the way that you handled your short chapters, for example, since we were talking about that. It really keeps me engaged. You were ending on good hooks so that I wanted to turn the page. All those things, you feel really good. But then within those chapters, you had a character who you couldn't remember if that was um, Alex or Alan. And so you, instead of being like, hey, your names both start with A and that's stupid, like people were going to get confused. You should change that. Being like, hey, are you aware that you start two of your side characters with uh, the letter A? Um, do you think, do you think that, or is that, is that on purpose? What are you doing that for? You know, so like any kind of constructive criticism comes as a question and the way that we receive it. Well, let me not speak for you because I am the most sensitive writer in the world. I really do get defensive. I don't know. Quickly. There's a lot of people vying <laughs> for that title. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I am. And so I do, I look for hacks, ways that I can be able to receive feedback with less resistance to it. Because in the end, I always am going to seriously consider your feedback. Mm -hmm. It's just the tongue lashing in between. I'm trying to mitigate that for everybody involved. Yeah, yeah. I know I that feeling apologize. of like just getting a negative comment of any kind and kind of feeling like yeah. you just want to crawl under a rock, which I know that's a very uh -huh. cliche thing, but it's exactly how it feels. It is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you can if you can pose as much of the criticism in, in the form of a question, I think people leave getting the point and it gives them more opportunities for how they resolve the problem. Yeah, because sometimes you really did mean to start both of your characters with the letter L. There was a reason you did it. Yeah. Uh, and instead of saying, don't do that and making you second guess yourself, they've opened it up and said, is there a reason you did that? Why did you start both of those characters names with L? And and then if it's a non-issue, you walk away feeling good. Everything's fine. Yeah. Um, we got so far off track, though. I'm sorry. Where did we leave off on? Uh, we were talking about. Oh, yeah. We were just talking about, yeah, just style and general. Oh, yes. Style. So, yeah. yeah. So I think that answers a um, lot of it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Give me just kind of a, I guess, a, a bulleted list of the, of, of the, of major events of. I started writing the book. I finished it. I started shopping it, and now I'm here. Kind of a, kind of a thing. Yeah. Um... I'm no longer clear on when I started writing The Nine Lives of Marva DeLonghi. I believe, I know I was in a hotel room. I was working mm -hmm. a sales job at the time. So uh, I don't remember what state. I want to say I was in Montana. I'm fairly certain I was in Montana in a hotel when I started that book. Huh. And um, it took me, overall, it took me five years to write it. Uh, so and that's just working on a little here, working on a little there when you had time and when well, you could. Sure. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I I was working on it daily. Um, my first two novels, both they took me five years apiece to to finish. Um, well, with the style that you were talking my... about too, like exactly, I'll write until I find a fault in it, and then I'll get rid of the whole thing, scrap it, and start again. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot, a whole lot of learning, not a whole lot of product for it. I'm getting a little bit better at that. I have nine finished novels that I think are realistic at this point, and just need kind of the sprucing up at this point. So, I have sped up considerably in the last couple of years at producing, but. Um, the Nine Lives of Marva DeLonghi it took five years. Uh, I got Annie as an agent in 2019. So I celebrated my three-year anniversary in April of being with her and not having sold the book. Uh, that she's still with me is a testament to who she is as a person. And so um, if you can somehow detective out who I'm actually working with, you should submit to her if you've got good stuff because she's fucking awesome. <laughs> she's a really great human being. Um, hard worker and the sharpest editor I've ever seen. She found she found plot hole issues that I didn't I would have never and I'm sure readers wouldn't have caught. She's so insightful. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that process it took me five years to write it, uh, and yeah, I'm working on the second in that series because now I understand those characters really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I really want to to continue their story. So that's awesome. you talked about you like doing the marketing and that all kind of seems like it ties into the idea with your podcast so what uh what was the motivation for your podcast mine was honestly to start building an audience that i could eventually pitch to hi everybody <laughs> but uh you know it's it's become like a network of of cool creative people uh what was what was your original intention with it yep uh, it was the same as yours. I wanted to build a, a an audience that would know me well and trust me and trust my process and so want to read my book. Yeah. Because um, I've always felt if you actually pick up and read my work, you're going to get hooked. That's 
I mean, who doesn't write and think that, I guess. So, but I mean, yeah, if you're yeah, a fighter is, in the game, you got to yeah. believe you're going to win, right? That's right. That's right. And so I do think it was built out of that process of having, um, wasn't quite three years at that point when I started the podcast, obviously, but, uh, I realized the reason that Annie hasn't been able to sell this book is because I'm nobody. I'm literally nobody. I have no credentials, anything. And so I thought I'm going to make a real effort to build a following on social media. I'm going to figure out how it's done and I'm going to do it. I'm going to spend the time getting it done. Um, let me just really shortcut and say, I got into real estate investing because I thought at a time in my life that that would be my patron of the arts. I thought about in times gone by, there used to be patrons of the arts so that artists could spend their entire life being creative. Mm. I wanted to create that for myself. So I bought a bunch of houses, turned them into rentals, I was moving down that, that road at considerably good speed, but with so much energy and effort. Um, and I was writing on a blog for, for this particular service and doing all kinds of things, just being super engaged with that community, making friends. People loved what I was doing. And then I woke up one day, I swear I woke up one day and I just thought I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm doing it for all the right reasons, but I'm wasting literal years of my life trying to build out. So I hit the pause button. I told my wife, um, I'm quitting my job, uh, my W-2. We're going to sell our rental houses and we're going to make a run at this. And if I can't make it happen by 2025, then I'm the actual hack in the room. Um, and so that's the process I'm in the middle of right now is is I've got till 2025 worth of, of rental real estate that I can sell and live on, support the kids, the wife, look respectable. And then I've got to get an insurance job again at the end of the road if it doesn't work. Um, Man, but that's uh, that's, yeah. that's a really great story. Like just this, put it all on the line. Cause I've thought about doing, I don't have, I don't have uh rental properties or anything like that, but you know, my wife is a nurse and we thought about just selling the house that we're in now. Cause mm -hmm. our market is yeah, crazy from where we started. <laughs> yeah. 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 Crazy yeah. from where we started. So after only living in this house, not even 10 years, we could make a substantial profit on it. Mm -hmm. She could travel nurse, make double the yeah. money she's making now. And Absolutely. I can, I can write blogs, work on my novels, do podcasts from anywhere, but, uh, I'm not I just, I can't you do pull it, the trigger. Do it. No. No, I know. I keep thinking what a, what a unique inspirational person I'd be, but I would just be now I'd be like, well, it was his idea first. No, no way. No. See, this is the thing we all, we all get inspired from each other, but, um, it, it, I will tell you it's rewarding. The most difficult part for me right now is that I'm never shutting off. And so I need to figure that out with my wife. Um, I was sitting downstairs. Well, last night. That sounds like, sorry to interrupt, but that sounds like yeah, yeah. Uh, just from some of the things you've told me about yourself, that that's kind of you though. Like you get mm -hmm. something and then it's like a nonstop wheel. Mm -hmm. I, well, I don't mean to is. go like crazy at you like that. I didn't even, <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't even think you. about it while I was doing that. This, yeah, I'm doing the, you know, I'm doing the wheel next to the temple while I'm talking to him. I didn't, I didn't think about it. Yeah, that was, no. All right. I am crazy, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, But yeah, it's, it's, it's been really rewarding. It is challenging and you're correct. I don't shut off, but at least I used to look like it. Now I have my laptop like tied to my hip. So. Well, and it's different when it's passion and to. not just. This is mm -hmm. me trying to like build my financial empire, but like, mm -hmm. this is me trying to do something that I love mm -hmm. first and foremost. I, yeah. It doesn't feel like as much work. Absolutely. It doesn't. Yeah. I'm, I'm not getting fatigued. I think the only times I get fatigued and I have a, um, someone who mentors me a little bit in the podcast space. His name is Kevin Schmedlin. Um, he, he, that sounds made episode. up. Did you say Kevin Schmedlin? I did say Kevin Schmedlin. It is, it's a, it's a real name. <laughs> I'm not making fun of you, Kevin. I just wanted to make sure that he wasn't like being la di da about getting your last name right. <laughs> so he, he talks, <laughs> he talks about uh, burnout and he says basically burnout really actually happens not when you work too hard, but when you work really hard and you don't see an end in sight. So I will have moments like that where I'm like, what am I doing all of this Twitter for? Because it's like, it is my whole life right now because I get the most results on podcast downloads, which gets me closest to having an audience, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. I spend a considerable amount of time there trying to do that. And um, I don't usually get burnout unless I start to see like stagnation. And then I suddenly am questioning everything. So yeah. When did you start the podcast? I think you said it in there, but. I started recording episodes in November of 21. So um, I launched officially first week of January. I've been at it for four months. Oh, um, so you did quite a bit of prep before your actual launch and release, huh? I did because I was able to steal time from my my employer at that time. Um, and I'm 
comfortable saying that, honestly, I, I, at that point knew that that job wasn't for me. They had not been fully honest with me. I can, I can justify my behavior, whatever. I knew for sure I did what I was required to do by them, but I spent a lot of time doing what was handsome for me. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it gave me a little bit of time and runway. And then at the point where it became obvious that I could no longer manage both, I just told my, my employer, I got something better. Yeah. Which is a nice feeling. It was nice. It was nice. Yeah. It's one of my favorite days ever, actually. Yeah. I left teaching because I think I already told you, but uh, I just had too many kids and it was at a point where it was like, I should just stay home. It makes about as much sense money wise. And (laughs) just being able to look at somebody and be like, I don't want to work here anymore. Felt very good. It wasn't like the, the storm off. Fuck you, everybody that like, you know, everybody (laughs) kind of deep down wishes they could do. But to yeah. just like look at somebody and be like, I don't need this anymore. Feels good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. Eventually, I'll need something again. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think it'll be teaching. Hopefully, it'll be world touring with uh, you on our books. Exactly. I think I think I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen for both of us. A podcast is a beautiful space to to do this and um, getting in somebody's ear and telling them the truth and telling them your, your emotional truth is, is, uh, a winning recipe, I think. Yeah. Oh, dude, we didn't even say the name of your podcast, did we? All right. Create, collaborate. Hey, thank you. Yeah. I would have, I probably would have just completely spaced it. Yeah. Create, collaborate. I use eights at the end because I want people to struggle finding it. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know about nice, but I did it. So, and that's not the real reason in case anybody's curious. <laughs> I am crazy, but not that kind of crazy. And uh, so not all the uh, episodes are interviews, but a good number of them are, and they have kind of like rotating themes, right? Yeah. Um, so what, what I'm, what I'm hoping to accomplish, and it, it was a bit of a, a, a rapid search to figure out what, what is my niche. Uh, it's why I, I interviewed you on my show because i was really inspired by your idea of kind of like being niche maybe not just a little bit by, uh, yeah not not being in a niche necessarily you have you have a basic idea of creativity and and you interview creative people um and for me i wanted to drill down into exactly who i was talking to and why and i think i'm probably still a little too broad honestly for my own taste but um first time novelists who want to sell their uh, novel and make money or publish their novel and make money doing so. So that's exactly who I'm speaking to. Um, and so I, I interview anybody that I think can help me teach people how to market and get comfortable with different ways of doing it. We've had episodes on TikTok. We've had episodes on Facebook groups. I just did one on a mailing list. Um, but I also am really interested in the mindset because, and, and I think this episode uh, that, that you're putting together right now at this moment is probably reflective of how important mindset is to me. I get a lot of emotional highs and lows. And it's, mm. so I'm speaking to somebody a little bit like myself who, who needs a, a boost yeah. frequently. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's a part of what I hoped this podcast would do for people who listen and just, you know, the people that I interact with is that we kind of psych each other up a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. I like your brand of it too. I, I want to say that I think right now your your style beats my style. Um, you've been in the game a bit longer, but I, I, you may just always be better at this than I am. Um, and well, it's because you have like just mine's this two to you. two years old too. The first the yeah. first year was rougher. The numbers <laughs> reflect it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm going through that, but I think you have a real a real warmth to you, um, a friendliness, and uh, you're insightful. You keep the pace slow, and that's that's good in a good way. I'm mean, like I you could you could hear slow and be like, what is he? But <laughs> yeah, you, you let the conversation marinate. You're not in a rush to ask the next question. It makes for an enjoyable um, talking experience and a listening experience. Well, good. I'm glad you feel that way. Um, I I kind of hope that it comes off that way because like right now I'm looking around. I have a notepad that I'm keeping notes on, but I don't I don't even have like bullets for today what I want to talk about. It's I've done enough of them now that I kind of feel like. I know where to poke and prod, but like you said too, no. if somebody says something that's interesting, I'm not going to look down and go, well, that doesn't have anything to do with the next question. So I'm just going to have to leave that there. I'm go, <laughs> Let's talk about that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'll find, I'll find that I get better at that. I actually do that a little bit. I'm sorry for the background noise. No worries. Reminder. Um, yeah. I find that I, I leave people off too much right now and I need to be less agenda oriented. Yeah. It is hard because you feel even though you're not like on live radio, 
anytime you feel silence and then there's just somebody, especially on like a computer like we're doing now, and somebody's just kind of looking at you expectantly, you're like, <laughs> are they looking at me like I'm fucking this up right now? What? Well, I yeah. Say something. Say something. <laughs> say it. <laughs> yeah. Instead of just being like, okay, huh. All right. And I still feel that thing in my gut like, don't take too long with this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah. 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 I try to keep it real. <laughs> Tell me where everybody can find you. Do you have a website? Do you have social media? Uh, are you out flipping signs in the corner of Clifford and Bustle? I don't know. I, I should be, although I live in a town of a thousand, so it would be uh, anticlimactic if I were doing signs. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, probably the easiest place is www.createcollaborate.com. So it's C-R-E, then the number eight, and then collaborate. Instead of the A-T-E, you have the number eight. Uh, you can find me almost anywhere. There. In fact, you can find me everywhere from my website. And so if you just link to that in the show notes, people will find me where they want to. If you like a good conversation, Twitter is my universe right now. And uh, I strive really hard to ask thought-provoking questions about writing and process every single day and answer as many people as I can. Um, I just started TikTok and I'm horrible at it as of right now, but I'm (laughs) going to try to get better because there's apparently all kinds of opportunity. I think 88% of TikTok is pretty horrible at it. (laughs) You know, I mean, most, most social media, if you just like, were able to take a blanket look at like a random cross section of a thousand people, half of them don't know what the hell they're doing. (laughs) (laughs) This is very true. Oh man, their stories. Out of the other half, 25% of them are just taking pictures of their foreheads. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, if you could just if you could just ask people what they were thinking with their profile picture, that would make me happy. I'd be like, "Why that? Of all things, <laughs> it kind yeah. of looks like an anus. I'm not sure." Oh my god. Okay, so a, a buddy of mine, Joshua Marcella, he's a a really good self published author. He writes uh, horror. He had somebody just come at him hard on Twitter, and I looked at the person who wrote this very insulting message, and their profile picture was a dog's butthole. I was like, well, I mean, that person basically answered the question, what's their problem? They're an asshole. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That is a special moment. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. so, sorry, I had to say that because as soon as you're like, they look like an ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't understand it. It might be the same can. guy. <laughs> like you ask a good question every 20 minutes these questions that you ask people like how do you surprise yourself with your writing was yeah. the and then there was another one that you just answered to or asked oh how do you get a how do you get a fresh take on your own writing or something like that mm-hmm. and i yeah. kind of like half joke joking said smoke some pot <laughs> yeah but uh <laughs> it's which is great because i literally like the question right before that was do you use any substances to enhance your creative process so i was like you answered the wrong question dude <laughs> it's, a twofer. it's a twofer yeah um it's an old george carlin trick right That's right. right sober and then edit with just a couple of hits a week um yeah but uh yeah no the, the questions that you ask they are engaging they are ones that i find myself even if i don't have the time like i'll stop and i'll hit reply and then i'll go you know what i don't I can't be doing this right now. I got to do my thing. Like you, is there a secret sauce? Do you have a, a certain mindset that you go to when you're trying to write these? Do you kind of get inspired by other quotes, by other questions? Mm. You, you, you just seem to have like a nonstop well of these. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the, the, the first answer is the first place that I went, I ripped off a list of questions and I'm comfortable doing it because they're out there public anyways. Um, the John Fox review, I think John Fox, wherever you are, your book review, if you look him up, you'll find him. He has a ton of great value. So I went to his website, 55 questions to ask writers and literally just started loading those to start with. Um, I got to the end of those and I did some more searches to try to figure out like, are there any other that spark interest in me? And I used those and kept going. And now I'm at the point where every morning when I wake up, uh, it takes me too long to think of new questions or new ways to ask similar questions, or yeah. I'll see uh, a question that I asked and I got responses. Like the, the one that's really taking me off right now is that I asked the question, if nobody ever in the history of the world for all of time would read your writing, 
would you continue to write? But I accidentally ended that question with except for your family or outside of your family. And so I landed on that beat and everybody's like, my family doesn't read my writing right now anyway. So, and I'm like, that's not the question. <laughs> so that one will come back around in yeah. some future iteration. Cause I do want to know why, why do you write and why are people so enamored with writing for themselves? Like what's up with that? I, I daydream if I want to write for myself. And if you have a different feeling about it, that's cool. Uh, but that's what I'm getting at. And so now the process is honestly horrible. Um, it's a bigger burden than I want it to be. And I'm trying to think like, what questions do I really, really want answered right now? Um, and some of that does come from reading essays. So uh, I was trying to quickly look up the lady's name, but she wrote a, a essay called Why I Write. I'll send you the link for it if I can, because anyone should read it. It's just two quick pages. Yeah. And it is uh, beautiful. She states like a thousand reasons why she writes in an essay form that's gorgeous. Yeah. It's always nice to hear people that have a, um, an eloquent response to those kinds of questions too because i never have good ones and always re lean on stuff like honestly i'm just i'm not good at that many things and this is one of the things that i do that makes me feel good <laughs> yeah I, as funny as that is I, I really like that response um yeah i i, I just want to hear the truth i do and that's this has taught me a lot asking questions has taught me more than i could have realized well is there anything that we should talk about that we haven't covered already. I feel like we're at a pretty good spot. It's been tremendously fun. Like I said, um, you you were an inspiration to me. I think you reached out to me if I if I recall right, and then I pitched you like right away. I think that's how it happened. I think so. Um, and and I like immediately came back with a pitch because I I listened to your show pretty quick and I was like, this is something special. This is a really hmm. cool thing that's it's different. And so I reached out and I wanted to be on your show. Um, and I was lucky enough to have you on mine as well. Um. We've covered a lot and it's been fun. And I, I would like to continue to stay in touch um, because I have a lot to learn from you. Ah, well, likewise, likewise, uh, <laughs> you've you've made it past uh, the a few points in the journey that I couldn't I, I, did, I couldn't even get an agent to be like, you know what? Let me seriously consider this. <laughs> so <laughs> my hat's off to you already. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I'm going to keep listening. Yeah. And uh, oh. The last thing we'll talk about here, and then we'll get off yeah. real quick. I'm just going to say that there was one episode that you had about um, people not being uh, supportive of your writing. Yeah. I had a big thing with that, but um, I think a lot of mine was kind of like brought on by myself because I was telling people about what I was doing while mm -hmm. I was still doing it. And mm -hmm. that's, I, I feel like if, if I, if I could tell anybody, especially a first time novelist, just kind of keep that under wraps until it's like mm. almost done and fully ready to be read. That's brilliant. Yep. You're absolutely right. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant, brilliant truth. Do not, do not tell people you're a writer, even though you feel like you're betraying yourself until you know that you're close to, to where you want to be and can handle that. There are maybe some people who have thicker skin than, than me, but listen, I've been, I've been writing seriously now for over 15 years, coming close to 20 years without anything substantial to show for it. And that's a long, long time for people in your family who already enjoy gossiping about you <laughs> to, to be like, what a failure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know that I feel that to that same, uh, to that same point, but with me, it's more yeah. like, I think, <laughs> I think some people are just like embarrassed for me. Like, Hey, my book's <laughs> finally done. And they're like, Oh, is it? That's, that's, that's just great. Bless your heart, you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, well, Jody Sperling, host of Create Collaborate. <coughs> I'm not editing that up. <laughs> Thank you for coming on the show. Send me something to read of yours, please. And, yeah. um, Anything that you really want me to put in the show to make uh, in the show notes, send me a send me a note on the side too. Hey, here's what I want: um, a piece I'm proud of. It's a short story, but it's very much reflective. I just thought of it, or I think maybe I just crossed my mind earlier. Mm. Um, Bull men's fiction. It's a free piece of uh, short story writing I did in a it's B U L L. If you type that in my name, you can find it, um, and it is called um, simply Valesco. Um, 
it's it was so much fun to write and i i submitted that for years and years before anybody accepted it for publication it wasn't changed a, a wink along the way i knew for sure it was the perfect story uh for what i was able to do with that particular story and, and so i i would be proud of uh anybody reading that Ooh, i'll put that into v a l e s c o did i get it right perfect man yeah absolutely <laughs> yay my my english degree finally paid off <laughs> yeah there you have it <laughs> <laughs> all right man well thank you sincerely thank you. for being on um say goodbye and then hold on for just a second before you actually get out of here you got a goodbye <laughs> all right everybody that was jody sperling if you are just hearing him for the first time ever there's a lot more good stuff at createcollaborate.com and the podcast of the same name create collaborate go check out jody listen to his podcast and eventually when his book comes out, I hope you'll consider buying it, just like I hope you'll consider buying mine. You can see more about mine at ChristopherTallon.com. And uh, that's it, man. Have a good one. Love you guys. Mwah. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Weird, right?